thank you to our wonderful staff from BPS. I will give the members of the committee until exactly one o'clock to join us here on um, our virtual Senate Judiciary Committee. And according to my calculations, it is now 1 p.m. and I am happy to welcome everybody to the very first meeting of the 81st Sessions Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, really quick, I wanna make sure that I can be heard and seen. No one's gesticulating wildly at me, so I'm guessing that we're all good. And I want to welcome our members of the committee. Um, I'm. We're all learning here. <laughs> How, how to work in this virtual world. So um, I am scrolling through the top and that's the order that I'm going to go in. Um, I'm going to welcome Senator Orenshaw, who I see is here. Senator Hansen, I see is here. Senator Pickard, Senator Harris. And um, we will also be joined shortly by Minority Leader Settlemeyer and Vice Chair and Majority Leader Canizaro. And I will ask the secretary to, oh, I see Minority Leader Settlemeyer joining right now. Yes, Senator Settlemeyer, thank you. And I am sure the majority leader will be with us shortly. And I will ask the secretary to mark her present when she is here. And um, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you today to the Assembly Judici Assembly, the Senate Judiciary Committee, as well as um, all of our anonymous audience members. Normally we have the pleasure of seeing all of your faces, but today you guys get to stay in your pajamas and log on from wherever you might be um, uh, with a cat, with a bat, on a town and a clown, wherever you might be. And um, so the, and we're gonna take a few minutes right now to go over some of the differences that you're gonna experience this year being virtual. Um, and I want to explain that the legislative building is currently closed. Um, all of our committee, meeting, committee meetings will be virtual and you can participate either by Zoom or telephone based on the type of participation that um, you are called upon to, to engage in or that you desire to engage in. Um, so as in all previous sessions, all of the committee related information will be available on NELIS. That is short for the Nevada Electronic Legislative Information System. It's accessible through our website. I am guessing you already found it if you are here today, but always feel free to reach out to myself or members of the committee staff who I'll be introducing to you shortly. Um, if you have any questions about our committee website. Um, if you are seeking to engage with the committee, which we hope you all will do, uh, you can register to participate in the committee through the new Nellis system, which places you in line to testify on a bill or provide public comment during the meeting. In order to do that, you'll go to our committee website or our the link to our committee on the Nellis website go to the specific meeting date that you're looking for, and there will be a link there that says participate. And so if you click on the participate link, that will give you the option to register to testify or make a public comment. Um, you are also welcome and encouraged to submit written comments to the committee. All of those are reviewed by the members of the committee and they will be made to the public as well. Um, there is a committee email address on the website. We also have a fax number um, and if any of you are going to send us a fax, please let me know because I would like to see a fax machine in action. Um, and I think that'd be a really fun piece of history. Uh, but that's not to discourage you from sending a fax, do it. You can also mail us stuff. I mean, whatever, whatever you need to do to, to let us know what you think and how you feel about our, our committee, we are here for it. Um, you can also share your opinion via the Nellis Legislature's Opinion application. And of course, if you just want to view the meeting, uh, which we welcome you to do, you can do that on Nellis or through our associated YouTube link. Um, during the 2021 legislative session to testify on a bill or provide public comment, you must register first. So you can register uh, during the meeting, but there will be a delay and we encourage you um, as much as possible to register beforehand. Um, that will put you in a queue and 
once your registration is submitted, you'll get a confirmation screen and receive an email that gives you the phone number and the ID to call in to make your comment. So you might be watching on your computer, pick up your phone, call that number in order to make your comment. Um, just a note that while meeting registration is required to participate, it does not guarantee that you will be able to speak. Similar to previous sessions, testimony and public comment may be limited due to time constraints. And in fact, they may actually be limited a little bit more uh, this session because we are relying on BPS to provide us with these wonderful video links. And there are other committees who have to meet after us. Specifically, there are committees at 3.30. So we will be out of here by 3 p.m. pretty much every day um, until the whole schedule uh, shifts at the end of the session, as you may or may not be aware, always happens. Um, when you're on the phone line, please pay attention to which bill is being considered and follow the verbal prompts provided by BPS staff so that you know which keys to press to raise your hand and unmute yourself. Staff will call on you to speak by the last three digits of your phone number. And detailed instructions for participating in committee meetings are also available on the help page, which is linked in the banner at the top of every single page on Nellis. If you need assistance with any of these processes, or if you would like to receive electronic notification of the committee's agendas and minutes, please contact our committee manager at the committee email listed on the agenda. The Senate Judiciary will meet either virtually or in room 2135 at 1 p.m. every day. Uh, likely we will not be meeting on Fridays for the beginning of session um, until we have so many bills that we have to start meeting on Fridays. Everyone should expect like I said, those meetings to run for two hours, Monday through Thursday with numerous bills on the schedule. A Friday meetings will become regular as we approach the April 9th committee passage deadline. And you can refer to our committee agenda for more specific meeting information. Um, I think this will also make it as important as ever, perhaps more, uh, that you really utilize the written comment function and written testimony function. Um, like I said before, if you email us your comments or your testimony in advance, it will be provided on Nellis, and that way we can keep our meetings to two hours but still have the opportunity to get everybody's input. Um, for virtual meetings, testifiers will be asked to state and spell their names after being called to testify. Uh, that's very important for our wonderful committee secretaries who are taking down your name. So please have patience with us if we ask you to spell it more than once and please speak loudly speak clearly and provide that information at the beginning. Um, we also ask you to mute your computer or your microphone, your phone, whatever it might be while you are not speaking. Um, and next we are going to talk a little bit about amendments and exhibit formats. Um, as you know, we'll be using the Nellis system. The Senate requests that any exhibits you wish to provide be supplied to our committee manager no later than 5 p.m the day before the hearing so they can be uploaded to Nellis. Um, and you can see our committee agenda for additional instructions. Um, any person proposing an amendment to a bill being heard by the committee must propose the submitted, must submit the amendment in writing and include a statement of intent for the amendment. The proposal must also include the appropriate name and contact number. In a few weeks, we'll start doing our first work sessions. A list of bills for work session will be posted on the agenda as soon as possible after a, after a decision is made regarding work session bills. Again, amendments provided in writing are extremely helpful in crafting the work session document. I may be asking certain parties to offer comments or suggestions during work sessions, but I will remind you everybody that general testimony is not taken during a work session. Um, this committee will not be providing excessive paper copies of bills, exhibits, or other documents to either members or witnesses. For members of the committee who desire paper copies as a matter of course, it is your responsibility to arrange for such copies to be made available to you. Uh, the committee staff may, as a courtesy, be willing to accommodate these requests, but please do not expect that the agenda or the bills or the amendments or the work session document will simply be printed on what used to be a living tree and placed on your desk in the chamber or your desk in your office that will not be happening unless you specifically ask your staff to arrange for that to happen for you. Um, all documents will be made available in larger print, higher contrast or any other format necessary for accessibility. If uh, the particular software reader that you're using or other kinds of um, technology, assistive technology are not compatible with any information that you receive from 
this committee. Please let us know immediately and we will remedy the situation. Um, finally, or additionally, scientists have estimated that we, if we continue to utilize single-use plastics at our current rate, the ocean will contain more plastic than fish by 2050. Therefore, single-use plastics are hereby banned from the Senate Judiciary Committee. And anyone who brings this scourge into the committee, whether in person or on camera, will be subject to public reprimand. I do not want to see any plastic water bottles, any plastic bags, any other single-use plastic items on your screen or with your person during these meetings. And if you do it, you'll get a warning like this one, which is very serious. And I expect you all to follow this rule and be good to our environment. Uh, finally, we encourage everybody to stay safe and continue to appear remotely as long as necessary to ensure our community's return to health. While you are observing, participating, or testifying from home, we also continue to encourage civic engagement, especially amongst our youngest citizens. Therefore, unless and until they become disruptive, children and pets are welcome to join you on camera. This committee does very serious and important work, so we will expect everybody to conduct themselves professionally, even via camera. And the same rules apply to people of any age who wish to, who wish to testify before the committee. If your children would like to be heard, they can and must register with the committee staff and provide their name and affiliation. You can both register through the same link. You can talk on the same phone line, but they will have to give us their name and their affiliation, and then their marks will be recorded and memorialized just like yours for the record. Um, and with those comments, I am very pleased to introduce you to our amazing staff here on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, Beth Rikers is our committee manager. I believe she is um, here and does not have her mic and camera on because she is very busy keeping track of all of the rules that I just uh, spelled out and all of the business of this committee. Uh, Kayla Lee is my assistant. I think she is also um, watching from the wings to make sure that nothing goes too far off the rails here. And um, with when you call my office, you will probably get in touch with Kayla first. Uh, she's kind of the brains of the operation around here. Uh, Patricia Devereaux will be joining us again. She is our senior committee secretary. I don't think that she's in the meeting today, but you will certainly be seeing her. Today, I believe we have with us Gina Lakasha, who is our one of our committee secretaries. Sally Ram is also a committee secretary for us. I don't believe she's on the meeting today, but she will be joining us at a future meeting very soon. Uh, we are joined once again by Nick Anthony, our committee counsel from the legal division of LCV. I see Nick on the uh, video today, and we're happy to have you here with us. We also have returning Patrick Guinan, our committee policy analyst from the research division of the LCB. And Julianne King is our research policy assistant, uh, also from the research division of the LCB. And with that, um, I think we are ready to move on to our first order of business, um, which I believe is the um, reading and adoption of the rules. But I have a lot of windows open and I need to make sure that's correct. Um, Madam Chair, this is Pat Guyton, the committee policy analyst. You are correct, that's the next item on the agenda. And the rules are uh, in Nellis for everyone's review. I don't know if you wanna go through them they sort of um, reiterate some of the things that you spoke about in your remarks, as well as laying out uh, things like uh, the requirement for a quorum and that video conferencing and virtual meetings uh, constitute a meeting um, of the of the committee. There's a lot of a lot of stuff in there. They the rules follow uh, Senate Rule 53, which is in Senate Resolution Number One of this session. So I don't know if the, if the, if it's your pleasure. Chair Scheibel for me to go through all of them, or if you would like to just uh, see if the members have any questions or entertain a motion or how you want to, how you want to proceed, but I'm happy to do whatever you'd like. I think this is the perfect time to utilize uh, the Senate Judiciary paddles. I have provided every member of the committee with a paddle that has yes and no on different sides. So I can ask you guys, do you want Mr. Guinan to read the rules to you? Mm, I see lots of no's. Okay, then. We appreciate the 
for Mr. Guinan. I trust that all of our members will take a look at those rules and Roman. already take a look at those rules and maybe one of them even has a move <coughs> to adopt them. Madam Chair, could I ask a question? Absolutely. Senator Settlemeyer. Yes, Senator Settlemeyer. Would it be possible for Mr. Guinan to highlight any changes from last year's rules to this year's rules? Mr. Guinan, um, can you please let us know about any changes in these rules? Yeah, Madam Chair, um, rules as they're drafted and presented before you contain virtually no changes. They are almost identical to the rules from the last session uh, from the Senate Judiciary Committee. And the only change that I can think of um, off the top of my head without reviewing them very closely, and I'm, I'm about 99% sure they're, all, they're identical, is that um, in item number two, uh, it now reads that a video conference or virtual meeting shall qualify as a meeting together and the chair shall set the agenda for all meetings and the, the term virtual meeting um, was added to the rules. Otherwise, they're they're pretty much identical and they follow this just the Senate uh, Rule 53 rules. Thank you, Mr. Guinan. Thank you, Madam Chair. With that, could I make a motion to approve? Um, so moved. Um, but first, I think there was one other additional rule. I'm, and let me apologize off the bat. We are still learning the technology. I am still figuring out how to keep documents and my screen open. Um, I believe I added a rule, Mr. Guinan. I'm not sure if it made it into the final version, um, asking or requiring everybody to please stick with gender neutral terminology in this committee, whether you are a member, whether you are testifying, um, and specifically, I want everybody to know, and I'll repeat this a couple of times because I know that not everybody here, uh, not everybody who's going to testify from the committee is here today. And as people come before the committee, I may be reminding them that you may simply call me chair um, or chair Scheibel, no need for miss or madam chair or anything like that. And um, I will expect you to, to do the same with each other and with all of our witnesses. And that's the sure. only change uh, that chair I- Scheibel, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, this is Pat Guy, and I just wanted to acknowledge my oversight, I apologize. That is rule 16 in the rules. And I apologize for not mentioning that. My mistake. No worries. <clears throat> and with that, I believe there is a motion on the virtual floor to adopt the rules. Second. And a second. I think that was Majority Leader Canizaro. Um, all in favor, I believe we have to do this by a roll call vote for purposes of recording the vote. So I'm going to ask the secretary to take the roll call vote on this measure. Senator Scheibel, we have a motion moved by Senator Settlemeyer to adopt the rules and Senator Canizero has seconded, motion moved. So, so moved. The rules so moved. are adopted. Um, okay. Am I I'm sorry. Am I correct? We don't have to vote on it. Okay. Yes, I'll call the vote now. Um, <laughs> Senator Orenshaw. Senator Harris. Yes. Yes. Oh, I. I can't, I can't hear Senator Harris. Senator, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Senator Hansen. Senator yes. Picard. Yes. There, I can hear them now. I'm sorry, I wasn't hearing everybody. Voted? Is that everyone? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think we did it. I think we voted. I think we approved the rules. You guys, we're Excuse me, Madam start. Chairman. Oh. I don't know if I heard um, Senator Pickard. I was a yes. Thank you.
Chair Scheibel? Yeah. I'm in no disrespect by referring to your gender. However, put me down as a no. I'm not going to have a rule in place that says that I have to do that every time. As a sign of respect, I sometimes call people by male or female, and it is never meant in a disrespectful tone or in a term. And in that respect, though, I just put me down as a no on the rule. Thank you. And Chair, uh, Senator Canizaro, I, I, I will be a yes on the rules. And I was a yes as well, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is Pat Guinan. Can you hear me? Yes. I was just going to ask if we could have the, the committee secretary please just read back the votes through the roll so that we have it clearly on, make sure we have everybody's vote clear for the record. I, I agree. Madam Secretary, would you please? Chair, did you just refer to her as Madam? You sure did. The habit we're all trying to, I'm trying to break. Okay, this is the committee secretary. Um, the votes were Ken Earnshaw, yes. Harris, yes. Settlemeyer, yes. Hansen, yes. Picard, yes. Pickard, I'm sorry. Canizero, yes. Scheibel, yes. Madam, sorry, uh, Chair, uh, I did want to be recorded as a no because I will have a very difficult time. I've never called anybody male or female out of disrespect, so just put me as a no. And with that, I've, I think we have everybody's vote. I believe, have, I believe we have everybody's votes. I believe the rules have been adopted by the committee and we can move on to our next order of business, which is our very first bill hearing. And um, I'm gonna request just a one minute recess before we do that. All right, and we are back from our one minute recess. Um, I have consulted with my agenda. I forgot that we first have to review the committee report. Thanks, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's Patrick Guinan again, the committee policy analyst. We have we do a committee brief at the start of every session for the, for the members. Typically, uh, it's more helpful to new members or new legislators who haven't um, been on the committee or had this experience before. Um, so I'm not going to go through the full committee brief for everyone because we have a bunch of seasoned professional legislators on the committee who are all very familiar with what this committee does. I would just want to make a couple of couple of uh, points very quickly. One is that as the committee policy analyst, um, I am here to serve everyone on the committee and to offer analysis and assistance with issues that come before the committee. And that analysis and assistance is always nonpartisan and confidential. Um, and then I would just point out that within the brief, you can find um, contact information for myself and the other members of the staff who are uh, assisting the committee. 
the committee jurisdiction is listed within the brief, which is helpful. It's quite broad jurisdiction, and that's why the Judiciary Committee is the busiest policy committee in the Senate. So you can expect typically somewhere around 165 to 180 bills or so a session, which means we're going to be quite busy and the members should expect some act agendas as we move forward. The only change that I am aware of to our jurisdiction from last session is that the committee is going to be getting common interest community or HOA bills this session, I believe. And then the only other stuff that I would point out about the committee brief is that it does contain a list of relevant publications that the members might be interested in, including relevant bulletins on interim studies that were done prior to session starting. It also contains an explanation of Nevada's court structure and our criminal and punishment codes for felonies and misdemeanors, which can be helpful depending on what item is before the committee. So with that, Madam Chair, I would conclude and just say that if anybody has questions about the brief or would like further information from me regarding it or any other matters for the committee, I look very much forward to helping everyone and to doing some good work for you this session. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Guinan. Are there any questions about the committee brief before right now? I am not seeing any questions or comments. So with that, we will move on to our next order of business, which is our hearing on Senate Bill 21. And I believe we have our presenters here for Senate Bill 21. Yes, I'm ready, Chair. All right. Then I am also ready. And I will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 21. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, members of the committee. My name is Ross Armstrong, R-O-S-S-A-R-M-S-T-R-O-N-G. I'm the administrator for the Division of Child and Family Services. Also with me today is Sherry Vondrak, S-H-E-R-R-I-V-O-N-D-R-A-K. And we are presenting Senate Bill 21. The Division of Child and Family Services is a state agency that works in three different child serving systems, child welfare, juvenile justice, and children's mental health. So of our about 1,000 staff members, we are working in those three different systems. Currently, we have different background check rules for each of those systems. And so we end up in a situation where we have folks in one area, they can't go to another area because the background check rules are different. And sometimes we can't hire good people just because of some antiquated beliefs that past criminal behavior means that there's a particular threat in the present. And so what we did is we worked with the LCB on some language to just start from a starting point of standardizing exclusionary crimes across our three systems. And so that's what Senate Bill 21 does, is it really standardizes the exclusionary crimes across our three systems so that we aren't operating under different rules. The legislature has previously adopted the ban the box, if you remember that from a couple of sessions ago. And so through the state system, we no longer ask, have you been convicted of a crime or a felony? But in reality, then they show up to the interview and we say, okay, here's a list of exclusionary crimes. Have you been convicted of any of those? Because if not, we're not going to be able to go much further. So what this really does is tries to get it standardized across our three systems. And so what I'll quickly do is just walk through some of the changes in the bill. So section one applies to our juvenile justice facilities that the state operates at our parole bureau. And you can see, let me back up a little bit. The most comprehensive system in terms of exclusionary backgrounds was our child welfare system. So most of the changes updates the juvenile justice exclusionary crimes and the mental health crimes to the child welfare ones. And so you can see in section one, and there's an attachment that has kind of a modifications overview that I think helps summarize. It's easier for me to read than the strike throughs and stuff in the bill. So you can see there's about 10 different exclusionary crimes added to our juvenile justice facilities. 
Um, the Legislative Council Bureau helped us with some clarification um, on child abuse and neglect. Um, and then we also put a three-year time limit on federal or state convictions for controlled substance. <clears throat> I would say that's one that we frequently see a lot where we have our folks in the field that say this person is like the exact fit we need to help serve our kids. And they have, you know, a minor drug crime from 20 years ago and they're permanently excluded from, from being hired. So in all three, we added that three-year time limit on federal or state convictions for controlled substances. Um, in the child welfare one, again, that was the most comprehensive. So section three, we removed contributory delinquency from all three. Um, and then uh, at the recommendation of the Legislative Council Bureau added that any other sexually related crime um, would be included in there. Again, the three-year limit on controlled substance offenses. Section five of the bill relates to state operated children's mental health facilities. We operate three psychiatric residential treatment facilities, two in the North and one in the South and one psychiatric hospital in the South Desert Willow Treatment Center. And again, you'll see, um, you know, eight to 10 different added um, crimes to match the child welfare exclusionary crimes, the removal of contributory delinquency, uh, clarification of child abuse and neglect, and then a three-year time limit for federal and state convictions for controlled substances. Um, some other changes in the bill. So in juvenile justice and children's mental health, we could charge the applicant for um, the, the background check uh, that was not true in child welfare. And so that has been added in section three and sections two and six note that um, pending charges for specific crimes uh, may also allow the agency to terminate, not necessarily require, but allow the agency to terminate if there are pending charges um, I can tell you that no agency thinks when they come up with an agency bill, they're going to be the first bill <laughs> out of the gate. And so um, since this uh, bill language became public, we've heard from a couple stakeholders. Um, the first is Argentum Partners, and they um, submitted um, some ideas. They've been working really hard to make sure that our background check language throughout all Nevada revised statutes make it clear that it's a fingerprint background check and not just kind of a, a file check or something like that. And so we are certainly agreeable to that. Um, we also had a great conversation with the ACLU of Nevada um, yesterday who had some concerns that some of the additions um, may prevent some great people who have turned their lives around from working um, in these systems. And so um, we're committed to certainly collaborating on that. I think our, our end vision for this particular um, bill is to uh, have consistency across the board. So we have career pathways um, and, and it's just administratively easier to get people on board um, or to have them shift through different areas. Um, but then also to start a conversation really about what are those crimes in someone's past that are relevant to their current, you know, threat to health and safety in working in our agency. And so um, I look forward to that conversation. I'm happy to answer um, any questions that the committee might have. And um, so with that, uh, Chair, I will um, open it up for any questions or, or comments or thoughts. All right, um, I'm going to ask the members of the committee to utilize their raise hand button if they have a question. Um, when you are in our meeting, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there is a little reactions button. If you click on that uh, at the bottom, the, there's an option to raise your hand. When I click on mine, my hand goes up and then I can lower my hand when I've been called on. Um, so if there are questions from members of the committee, I will ask that you use the raise hand function. Madam Chair, I don't see that under reactions. Okay. So I, oh, I see Senator Pickard has a question. Go ahead, Senator Pickard. Thank you, uh, uh, and thank you for bringing the bill. Uh, this makes a lot of sense. I just have one question, uh, and that is with respect to, uh, my understanding is most of the employees uh, that are involved in, in uh, uh, the hire, or that will be hired and fired uh, are subject to a CBA, and uh, uh, there are gonna be some, uh, I, I would imagine some due process questions if we are terminating employment uh, based on a pending charge as opposed to someone who's been uh, found guilty of a charge. Uh, how do we square that with the uh, uh, the concept of 
you know, innocent until proven guilty and, and then whatever else the uh, uh, collective bargaining agreements might require before termination. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, the, the language that talks about the pending charges, you know, in my mind, a pending charge is um, there's been an arrest uh, and we're waiting for the district attorney to, to file those charges. Um, the language says that the institution or agency may terminate the employee, not that they must. Uh, and so it would be subject then to those due process things in any um, sort of collecting collective bargaining agreement that may be coming. I'm sure as you're aware, we don't have those terms yet or, or know what that agreement will look like. Um, but that will be, um, you know, so that, so it's not a mandatory termination. It's it's a may terminate and and could be done through the lens of the collective bargaining agreement or what we already have. I mean, the state already has a process for employees to appeal disciplinary measures, including termination. So, um, you know, there would be an evaluation through that process. Sure, and I appreciate that. And and I recognize it's uh, uh, not mandatory. It's uh, uh, discretionary. But for purposes of trying to figure out how this is going to play forward, uh, you assume that uh, the employer, uh, the, the uh, person uh, with that responsibility decides to terminate employment uh, without any kind of conviction. Um, and uh, I've never seen a CBA agreement allow for that. So uh, um, is it my, do I understand correctly that uh, even though it may be in statute that they may terminate uh, that will actually be subject to whatever collective bargaining agreement may exist today or may exist in the future. Uh, again, Ross Armstrong, for the record, you know, I, I can't comment because I don't have any knowledge about, you know, the pending collective bargaining agreement. I know in our, our current process, um, any decision to terminate, uh, there's an ability to appeal through an independent hearings offer, officer to determine if it was allowable. Um, you know, so the, in this case, since the statute um, permits it, uh, you know, I think we would have um, a pretty good um, chance of succeeding on the, the termination. Um, you know, if they, <clears throat> I would certainly think too, if, if the district attorney's office in this case, or city attorney's office, who's ever doing the prosecution determines not to, um, you know, not to go forward with the actual prosecution, that it would be, um, that termination would be withdrawn or potentially overturned. All right, I'm just trying to uh, determine if we're looking at uh, more litigation than we already have. So, um, uh, but I'll, I'll interpret that as yes, it would be subject to a uh, CBA process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And actually that raised a question for me as well, um, Mr. Armstrong, because you said that a pending charge would be um, the the time period between which somebody was arrested or cited and when the district attorney, the city attorney, the AG's office um, or prosecuting agency filed the charging document. But wouldn't a charge also be pending between the time the charging document is filed and the time of conviction? Uh, Ross Armstrong for the record. Yes, sorry, thank you for um, clarifying that for me. In my mind, you know, when, when we think about the intersection of criminal um, procedure and taking a look at employment decisions there's you know you can make a decision based on an arrest or if there's you know pending charges um, and then conviction so yeah I think it would include that entire time frame from post arrest to um, to a determination of conviction uh, or exoneration so to clarify if somebody were to be arrested um, and charges weren't immediately filed and then their arrest was known through this, from through this background check process, and let's say that the charges were ultimately never filed, it would be up to the person who's being investigated to submit that denial letter or that uh, decline to prosecute letter to their employer, indicating that actually charges are not being filed or were never filed against me pursuant to this arrest. Cor correct, Ross Armstrong, f for the record. And it's similar to, you know, even now when we have a, you know, a background check, um, it is not totally uncommon that there is a situation where there's no disposition on file. So we know there's been an arrest. <clears throat> Sometimes it's super old and there's no 
disposition has actually been entered into the system. And so we work collaboratively with the applicant at that point to try to figure out what occurred in that case, um, whether there were charges, whether it was dismissed, uh, maybe they were convicted and it was later expunged. So it would be that same process. Um, in my mind, in this particular situation, um, you know, depending on the nature of the crime that would trigger um, these provisions, uh, we would likely place um, the employee first on administrative leave and then continue to be in contact, you know, with that employee to determine what the status of their, uh, what the status of those charges are. Okay, thank you. And it looks like Senator Settlemeyer has a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, two questions, if I could. Page six, uh, 10, line 17. <coughs> I was kind of curious about, does that also include cannabis as, you know, a prohibited thing in that respect? So would that also potentially hinder someone from getting a job, even if they have a medical card? Uh, Ross Armstrong, for the record, yes, can, uh, cannabis is a particularly tricky issue because, um, you know, it, it, and this is where we see a lot of old, old convictions coming back right now. So right now, if you have a 20 year old cannabis conviction, um, then you're, you're disqualified pursuant to the statute. So, um, you know, I think that if they had an actual violation where they were convicted at this point, um, you know, they would raise that card up as a, um, you know, as a, as a defense in the criminal process that would then end to a disposition of, uh, you know, not guilty or not charged. So, um, but it, it is the language there that, that pings it not only on um, the state controlled substance, but federal controlled substance laws. Um, again, puts us in an issue sometimes where we've got really great people that we can't hire on. I appreciate that. I had an additional question if it's okay with you, Chair. Uh, page seven, five. I was wondering, what is the standard cost? Just because I'm not familiar with it. You know, what is the standard cost? And, and the reason I ask is concern. Would this also then apply to people that need to get welfare checks, so forth, for adopting of children, uh, things of that nature? You know, I look at some of the times with adoption, you know, these people are paying thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars. It just seems like another barrier to trying to get some of these kids into a good home. And that's why I was asking if you could just give me a range, what's the general cost? Yeah, uh, Ross, I'll defer to uh, Ms. Vondrak because I know she, she works with that a lot more. Yeah, thank you. Um, the average cost for background check ranges between 40 and $80, uh, dollars depending on the geographic location. Really appreciate that. That gives me a lot better comfort level. I was thinking of, you know, no offense, you get into the realm of, you know, the gaming industry and you're talking, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars for background checks. I, I just needed that frame of reference. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you, Chair. Thank you. And uh, for the record, I believe that the answer to the question was 40 to $80. And if we could get your name again. Yes, thank answer you. Answer the question. Uh, Sorry. Sherry Vondra, for the record. Okay. And we already have you registered with us. So our secretary has the spelling as we learn how to figure out how to keep proper records. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And are there any other questions? All right, then that concludes the presentation of Senate Bill 21, and we will now move on to testimony in support of Senate Bill 21. At this time, we will be not physically, but metaphorically transitioning from video to telephone. So if there anybody wants to testify regarding SB 21, um, they should have already registered uh, with the participate button, provided their email address and their phone number, have a phone number to call in. And I'm going to ask our fantastic staff at VPS if there is anybody on the phone line to testify in support of SB 21. Thank you, Chair. We do have some callers in the queue and I'm gonna go through the rigmarole here. So give me just one second. <clears throat> to testify in support, of the current bill. Callers on the line, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify, testify, excuse me, in support, please press star now, star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Caller with the last three digits of 685, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to begin your testimony. You may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 685, please press star six to unmute yourself. You will have two minutes to give testimony. You may now begin. Yes, caller, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, D A N I E L. P-I-E-R-R-O-T-T -T, with our Gentum partners, and I'm testifying on our client, Fingerprinting Express. Today, we come in support of SB 21 as amended, and would like to thank Administrator Armstrong for our conversations. I would like to provide some context to show the importance of this legislation. Fingerprinting Express, which has four locations throughout Nevada, utilizes the latest technology in fingerprint background checks, in addition to a myriad of other services to ensure the safety and security of Nevadans. As it stands, there are over 80 industries in Nevada that are required by statute to receive fingerprint background checks. While we think that anyone who works with children should have a fingerprint background check and are having conversations to move that needle forward, we believe that SB 21 will provide further protections for individuals who work with children. With that, this bill will create consistency in the statute to bring clarity to the existing procedure that several state agencies currently participate in, creating additional protections Chair, this is a broadcast. Caller, if you could hear me, we cannot currently hear you. Thank you, caller. Thank you, Chair. At this time, there are no more callers in support of Bill SB 21 at this time. All right. It sounds like um, our caller in support of SB 21 may have had some written remarks that they could submit to our committee manager uh, for publication as an exhibit to this meeting, and I hope that they will take the opportunity to do that. Um, I believe you just said that there is no one else in the queue to testify in support, so we will move to testimony in opposition of SB 21. Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition of SB 21, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in opposition of SB 21, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 695, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes. You may begin your testimony now. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel. This is Holly Wellborn, Policy Director for the ACLU of Nevada. It looks like we're going to have a lot of fun navigating these um, technical glitches, but, you know, we're all in this together. I want to make clear we 100% um, support where this bill is going, and the only reason we're testifying in opposition today is given you know, previous rules of the committee that if we have any potential changes that we um, that we oppose the bill. Um, in fact, you know we're we're um, it, opening up opportunities for individuals with um, previous drug charges to work, particularly in the juvenile justice system, has a significant positive impact for young people. It, um, it puts uh, folks into contact and youth that are in the justice system into contact with um, individuals who have similar life experiences, and um, those employees can draw on those experiences to provide better services to children in that justice system. But um, the issue that we have right now and that we're working through with Administrator Armstrong is that we can contemplate some circumstances where this could, could do some harm, but um, what we have asked is to look um, to, to see whether or not making changes in um, section one, sub one, and um, you know, adding some of these criminal penalties in consideration of these exclusions in consideration of employment, if A, that's going to affect any current employees, 
And B, we also, you know, contemplate circumstances and in our experience in working in this field, there are a lot of, you know, previous sex workers who might have a, a criminal offense from, you know, decades ago who are pursuing, you know, a career now in um, social work who um, perhaps might want to enter the field of juvenile justice and providing services in that arena. We've gone back and forth on this, and I do apologize for not um, presenting an amendment or conceptual amendment today, and we'll be sure that we, we continue to do that in the future, but we just, um, we're struggling in, in what section this would fit into. But what we think the solution is at this point is to provide the employer the discretion to override an exclusion from empo employment for good cause, and that would address all of the concerns we have about this and enable us to move forward with this bill. So we're very much in favor of working this out. I think we can get to a resolution in the next couple of days. Um, and with that, you know, we look forward to working with um, Administrator Armstrong and the committee on this. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 283, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes. You may now begin. Once again, caller with the last three digits, 283, please press star six to unmute yourself. You will have two minutes to give your testimony. You may begin. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, Committee Members, Marcos Lopez, Americans for Prosperity Nevada. Uh, we stand in opposition to this bill as it's currently written uh, for similar reasons as Holly has talked about uh, from the ACLU. Uh, we do believe that the time restriction is a good policy reform, but the whole other list of crimes that are being added to the prohibition list are not always directly connected to the roles in question. And we believe that the good here does not outweigh the harm caused by adding so many crimes to the list. Our POV is the same as when it comes to occupational licensing. If they must exist, any legal prohibition on someone working in a particular career should be directly connected to the duties of the actual job. For example, financial fraud and banking. Sections one and five add too many crimes to the prohibition list. And we would completely agree that it is the right of the facility slash supervisor to not hire someone for a job previously convicted of these crimes, but we do not think that it should be a legal barrier to getting that job. Someone convicted of a DUI could have successfully turned their life around and be a, the best culture fit or example for children in the facility, yet they would still be barred from employment under this law. For those reasons, we oppose SB 21 as it's currently written, but any potential changes or amendment, um, and we might be able to change our position on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, caller chair. This is broadcast. There are no more callers in opposition in line at this time. All right. Thank you both for your testimony. And I share in your hope that you'll be able to work with the sponsors of or the authors of the bill to come to a resolution before our work session on it. And um, as noted, you'll uh, submit a written amendment before that work session. Um, are there any testifiers in the neutral position on SB 21? Chair, there are currently no uh, neutral testimonies to be given at this time, but the phone line is open and working. All right, um, unless I've gotten so rusty in the last 18 months that I've forgotten something, I believe we can close the hearing on SB 21. Again, nobody is yelling at me physically or metaphorically. So I will close the hearing on SB 21 and open the hearing on SB 71. I believe we have uh, Treasurer Conine and a, a host of his friends here to present this bill. Good afternoon, Chairwoman and committee members. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Uh, for the record, I have the pleasure of being your Nevada State Treasurer, Zach Conine. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon to present to you Senate Bill 71. Uh, broadly, Senate Bill 71 makes changes to Nevada's unclaimed property statute in an effort to modernize and align Nevada's unclaimed property laws with national best practices and the Uniform Law Commission's revised Uniform Unclaimed Property Act, or RUPA. 
Pursuant to NRS 120A, the Treasurer's Office administers Nevada's unclaimed property program. In this role, the office takes custody of lost or abandoned property from individual and business holders and works to reunite it with its rightful owners. When property cannot be reunited with its owner, it is held in perpetuity by the state. When you all have a free moment, I would encourage everyone to search for yourselves at claimitnevada.org to see if the state is holding on to any money of yours. It takes less than a minute to search and we'll get it back to you at record time. For scope, last year our office processed and approved 38,368 claims, which resulted in a return to Nevadans of more than 46 million. On the holder side, that's people turning in funds to us, last fiscal year, holders reported and remitted over $71 million in unclaimed property to our office. Finally, when the pandemic began, our office looked for ways we could assist Nevadans who were hit hardest and were struggling. We teamed up with Dieter to use the unemployment insurance claimant list uh, to cross-reference our unclaimed property database to determine if we were holding unclaimed property for any UI claimants. To date, this initiative has resulted in $1.75 million in unclaimed property being returned to its owners. Uh, we receive weekly reports from Dieter on new claims filed and our efforts are ongoing. Unless there are any questions at that stage, I'd be happy to jump into a bill overview. I am not seeing any questions. Three, two, one, move on. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Sections two, three, and eight of the bill adopt language from the Revised Uniform Unclaimed Property Act, or again, ROPA, to better align Nevada's unclaimed property laws with other states. Section four of the bill allows the office to create a claim and deliver payment to the owner if we reasonably believe we have identified the rightful owner. Currently, the statute requires the individual to whom the property belongs to file a claim prior to delivering payments. And I mentioned at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic what we started doing with Dieter claimants, but what this will allow us to do is automatically connect that claimant with their money. What we've been doing is we send them a letter encouraging them to go file a claim because we believe that we've found their money. Uh, this would actually speed up the process uh, and make sure that we can get funds back to them directly. It also stops uh, folks from getting a random letter from the state treasurer's office and thinking we're trying to scan them. Uh, we'd rather just send them money. So our intent here is to verify the information and remit payment directly. Uh, however, given the current requirements of the statute, we instead, like I said, have to send Nevadans a letter. Um, this flexibility will allow our office to more efficiently reunite property owners with their property. Our intent is to use this allowance under statute as limited and controlled circumstances uh, like the Dieter mentioned above, where we have multiple points of personal information that match our database, things like birthdays, social security numbers, names, addresses, and phone numbers. Sections 5, 10, 15, and 17 of the bill simply make conforming changes to statute based on other changes of the bill. Sections 6 and 7 clarify the definition of an account of funds related to the cost of bur burial. This terminology was adopted last session through Senate Bill 44, and after speaking with the industry and Division of Insurance about implementation, uh, who governs these uh, pre-need contracts, we determined that additional clarity was necessary to ensure the intent of the law was achieved in the language. Section 9 updates existing language regarding the delivery of safe deposit boxes. Currently, the law requires that once a bank sends their report of the safe deposit boxes, they must wait 60 days before delivering those boxes to our office. As you can imagine, this creates inefficiencies for our staff as we have to put all safety deposit box work on hold for two months. The updated language will require safe deposit boxes to be delivered within 60 days, thereby allowing our team to get to work immediately once those reports are received. Section 11 allows our office to require proof that someone filing a claim on behalf of an estate has the proper authority to do so. The section also makes documentation received on behalf of a claimant confidential and not subject to public records. Collecting personal information is necessary to verify a claimant's identity and their relationship to property. We've included this change in statute to assure Nevadans that any personal information documentation they share with us remains confidential. The inclusion of this language will also save staff time by allowing our processors to focus on claims rather than redacting uh, record requests. Section 12, this change allows us to make property available for claiming once we receive it. Under a distinct existing law, if a holder business remits unclaimed property prior to it reaching the appropriate dormancy period, usually three years, we must hold on to the property for the same amount of time as the business would have. This issue most often arises when a holder goes out of business. 
Removing that requirement from the statute will allow our office to connect the vans with our property when we receive it, as opposed to holding on to it for additional years. Example here is, let's say there's a business that has uncashed payroll checks. The business goes out of business, uh, but they had that check from last week. We would need to hold on to that check for three years before releasing it um, to the person who has it. We want to speed up that time frame. Section 13 allows our office flexibility in our efforts to notify holders of an audit. We make every uh, effort available to give reasonable notice. However, in limited circumstances, this can be impractical, such as when a holder has multiple locations and does not re respond to a request to confirm the appropriate location to send notices to, or when a holder never acknowledges receipt of the notice. The section also allows us the ability to request copies of a document during an audit, rather than requiring our staff to travel on site to examine the originals. Furthermore, it grants us the ability to compel production of records through an administrative subpoena. These three changes modernize our auditing process and focuses our auditing staff's time on identifying reportable property rather than administrative back and forth. Section 14 requires holders of unclaimed property to hold on to backup documentation that verifies their non-reporting of property. For example, during the course of an audit, it could be found that a holder had 10 uncashed checks that were never reported or remitted to our office. The holder could claim that they canceled those checks, which would render them worthless and not reportable as unclaimed property. Under existing law, there's nothing in statute that allows our office to request backup information verifying their claim to prove the checks were indeed canceled. This would give us the ability to do so. Section 16 allows air finders to receive a higher percentage of property claimed. Currently, several professional firms exist whose business is connecting individuals with their lost and abandoned property. These firms get paid a percentage of the money they've located through written agreements with the property owners. Existing law caps that percentage at 10%. This change would allow firms who connect owners of properties older than five years old, so most would have been lost or abandoned for at least eight years, as there's a three-year dormancy period generally uh, before the property has been turned over, to charge up to 20% of the property amount allowed. Allowing for a higher commission better incentivizes those firms to find and connect Nevadans with missing money. Effectively, what happens is there's a period of time where if uh, the trail goes cold, it becomes much more expensive for air finders to connect funds to uh, people who've lost them. And so they don't try, right? The juice isn't worth the squeeze. The intention here is to encourage them to try and find uh, the air finders and return their property to them. Uh, I would add, uh, we're continuing to work with Senator Orenshaw on a possible amendment to this bill uh, regarding some additional ROPA language. Uh, we'll continue to commit the uh, committee apprised of our process. Uh, this concludes our presentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm sorry that the most exciting bill you hear this session happened so early in the process, but those are the shakes. Um, thank you for considering Senate Bill 71. And I happen to be joined this afternoon by our Deputy Treasurer for Unclaimed Property, Linda Tobin. We're happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Treasurer Conine. I see a couple of questions already. Um, I'm gonna go with the order that I saw the hands go up and we can fight later about whether or not that was fair. So, Senator Pickard, I saw yours first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of uh, basic questions, um, uh, not as to the details of the bill. I, I like where this is going. I'm just concerned. I sit on the uh, Uniform Law Commission and one of the things that they tell us all the time is that uh, we need to uh, make sure that we don't pass too many amendments too quickly uh, because number one, it doesn't allow the uniform law to mature and for you know the 50 states to figure it out or those states that have adopted it. So really figure out the nuances. And number two, if we all start uh, amending it, uh, it tends to go in different directions and it loses its uniform character. So the first question is how does this uh, comport with the uh, Uniform Regulation of Virtual Currency Act and the Supplemental Commercial uh, Law for that act that we passed uh, last session. Uh, how does this change what we just did? Uh, I'll turn that one over, Treasurer Conan, for the record, I'll turn that one over to our uh, Deputy Treasurer, Linda Tobin. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Senator and Committee members, Chair. Um, regarding the virtual currency, that is one of the things that we did specifically add into this draft of the bill was the Uniform Commission definition of virtual currency um, in attempts to bring all of those things into more harmony and give some clarity to our holders over definitions regarding virtual currency. All right, thank you. So uh, uh, if I understand then, we're just using the, um, uh, the language from the Uniform Act 
we're not actually making any changes to uh, anything that we adopted in that uniform act. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have. I like this. All right. Thank you. The next hand I saw was Senator Harris's and I'll advise um, members of the committee that you can also put your hand back down so that I know that your question has been answered. And um, I'm gonna try to just do one shot per person um, on an as needed basis. I may let, I may call on you a second time if you raise your hand a second time, um, but for now let's keep it to once. So Senator Harris, it is your turn. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. Uh, Treasurer Conine, it's great to see you. Thanks for presenting this bill today. I have a little bit of a question about section two um, and its inclusion. Has has there been some effort for, uh, has someone tried to claim uh, the tokens from their Candy Crush uh, game? Is this, a, is this something that's arisen or is this kind of a forward looking uh, provision? Treasurer Conine for the record. Uh, well, I think it, it covers two things, right? One is, if Ropa has adopted it, they're adopting it because digital currencies exist in all sorts of firms, not just uh, extra lives in Candy Crush or uh, V-Bucks or V-Coins or whatever in, in Fortnite, but all sorts of other dollar-based um, coins. And so we wanted to make sure that we were ahead of that, especially as we look towards expanding uh, Nevada's participation in digital currencies through other economic uh, development efforts. We're trying to be ahead of it. And Madam Chair, well, Chair Scheibel, can I ask a follow-up? Would, would this include, I, I see the term uh, virtual wallet, would this include um, possibly uh, I've got a blockchain kind of virtual wallet or you know it exists solely in the digital space or is there some way to, would this exempt that? Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, I believe it encourages and includes um, all forms of digital currency, but I'll, I'll turn over to uh, Deputy Treasurer Tobin in case I'm misspeaking. Senator, this is Linda Tobin for the record, and I apologize before I did not uh, state and spell my name out. So that's L-I-N-D-A Tobin, T-O-B-I-N. So there's actually two additional definitions, um, somewhat related, but slightly different. Um, in section two, it relates to the game related digital content. That all refers to non-cash value. So those electric wallets or virtual wallets would be, to your point, more the Candy Crush style. The second definition added in section three is for the virtual currency. And that is what would be more um, traditionally related to your cryptocurrency wallet, your blockchain, your strictly digital value-based currency propositions. Thank you. All right, if you're finished, Senator Harris, then uh, Senator Hansen, you may ask your questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hi, Zach, how are you? I've got a question actually going way back. Uh, in my freshman year on this committee, uh, William Horn was the chair, and we had a bill back then about uh, virtual, I don't know if it's still called virtual currency. Essentially at that time, people would take a hundred bucks and you get a gaming, a you know, $100 gaming, whatever it would be, that they'd put in the machines and they would frequently only use uh, $98 then. And that ended up being put into some kind of unclaimed property thing. At that time, I remember Chair Chairman Horn was saying it was something on the range of 25 to $50 million that would have sheet back to the state. And we passed that law back then. Um, and, and so two questions. One, what has that done financially for the state since then? Just kind of curious. And does the virtual currency thing and this bill impact that in any way? Thank you, Senator. Treasurer Conine, for the record, you're referring to Ticket In, Ticket Out, or Tito, um, also one of the Jacksons. I'll turn it over to uh, our Chief Deputy, or Deputy Treasurer, excuse me, Linda Tobin, with regards to the financial impact, if she happens to have that on hand. Uh, otherwise, we can turn it over uh, offline. Uh, but this and that are not related. But Deputy Treasurer Tobin? Yes, hello. Linda Tobin, for the record. Um, regarding slot machine Tito's, those have not come to unclaimed property for quite some time. The Gaming Control Board and Commission adopted regulations, I want to say around 2011-ish, whereby they had specific tax reporting requirements for those Tito's, and they are 100% accounted for through the Gaming Control Board. We didn't get anything. Well, next time I see William Horn, I'm going to have to talk to him about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping we had some money for the state. By the way, well, Linda, I'm yeah. 
Tobin in any way? You know, Phil Tobin was the one that uh, 1931 introduced legalized gambling in Nevada. I am not, unfortunately. Well, thank you, Matt, uh, Chair Scheibel. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Um, your history lessons are one of the best parts of having you on committee, so I appreciate it. And um, if there are no further questions, comments, then um, I'm going to request just a brief one minute ish recess. And our recess is over. The bell has rung, metaphorically, and we're back. Um, and at this point in time, we will open the floor up for testimony in support of SB 71. Again, this is the time where we transition from the video conference to the phone lines, and our fantastic staff at BPS will tell us um, if there are people in the queue. Hello, this is Sierra with Broadcast. There are no callers at this time in support. All right. Um, if anybody logs in in support, we will take them out of order. At this time, we will move to testimony in opposition to SB 71. Chair, there are no callers in opposition on Bill SB 71. All right, thank you. The next we will move to neutral testimony. At this time, I am going to call directly on Senator Orenshaw. As you heard Treasurer Conine mention, he has um, a proposed amendment to this bill. I understand that he and the treasurer are still working through the details of that amendment, but I wanted to give him an opportunity to um, walk the committee through at least conceptually the contents of the amendment through the form of neutral testimony. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, for the record, James Orenshaw, I represent State Senate District 21. That's parts of Henderson and unincorporated Clark County. Uh, with me today, Chair, I have uh, Caitlin Wolf, who is the Legislative Council for the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws. 
uh, also called the Uniform Law Commission. The Uniform Law Commission is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that actually dates back to 1892 uh, when a group of 12 practicing attorneys, I believe from seven different states, got together and worked on the goal of where state law, if it is uniform, would be of assistance to uh, our constituents in whether it's commerce, uh, it went on to become in domestic relations, uh, family law, and many other areas where having some degree of uniformity across state lines is a benefit. States still have the right to be you know, individual in terms of the state laws they have, just like we have you know, legal gambling in Nevada and other states don't, but there are many areas uh, where uniformity is a benefit to our citizens. And probably the most famous law that uh, many of us know about is the Uniform Commercial Code, which uh, really aided commerce and business, uh, especially in the pre-digital era in terms of people uh, you know, using checks from banks and other states and making purchases across state lines. I wanna thank Treasurer Conine and his staff for working with me and uh, some of the other Uniform Law Commissioners from Nevada on the proposed amendment. The amendment that I've submitted on Nellis uh, for everyone's uh, view, makes references to some portions of the revised Uniform Unclaimed Property Act that if, uh, if the committee considers adopting, if the treasurer considers adopting, would help harmonize Nevada statutes with the recent revisions uh, in 1996. The original Uniform Unclaimed Property Act dates back to 1954. Since then, I believe over 40 states have enacted some version of the Uniform Unclaimed Property Act. Uh, Nevada, I believe, initially enacted the Uniform Unclaimed Property Act in 1979, and there have been some revisions and some updates through the years to comport with some changes and updates that were promulgated by the Uniform Law Commissioners. They meet every year, and delegates from all the states who are practicing attorneys, some of them are law professors, some are judges, some are legislators, get together and discuss these acts. And they actually have meetings where they go, they, they put every page of the bill up on a big screen and they have uh, discussions and floor fights over where a comma goes, where a semicolon goes. It's um, paradise if you're uh, a legal nerd like me. So it's it's tremendous and they, they really work hard on trying to make sure they, they get it right and they propose something to the states that tries to be a benefit to our, our constituents. Uh, Chair, with your permission, I'd like to turn it over to Caitlin Wolf, Legislative Counsel from the Uniform Law Commission, to walk us through the amendment and to answer any questions. And I'm here to answer any questions as well. That is fine with me. Um, Ms. Wolf, I saw earlier. There she Hi is. Hi there. Hi there. Hi, Chair Schneibel, um, Scheibel, members of the committee, Treasurer Conine. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. Um, as Senator Orenshaw said, I serve as legislative counsel to the Uniform Law Commission in Chicago. And as part of my role, I work with states as they consider enacting our uniform acts. And the revised Uniform Unclaimed Property Act um, takes up quite a bit of my time. I, um, I enjoy it a great deal. I spend a lot of my time speaking with administrators and their staffs, legislators about what is unclaimed property law, what is RUPA, and what does it do? As Senator Orenshaw mentioned, um, we hope to be working with um, the treasurer, with the committee on some friendly amendments that would, in effect, um, bring Senate Bill 71 into conformity with the revised Uniform Unclaimed Property Act. Um, RUPA represents um, you know, decades of work and study in the development of unclaimed property law. Um, as Senator Orenshaw mentioned, um, uniform acts are in development over a number of years. For RUPA, um, that meant it was a three-year drafting process with more than 125 stakeholders involved, folks from um, administrators, consumer groups, um, holder groups, business groups, um, that took part in this process. Um, and I will um, just run through a couple of quick highlights, some of the benefits of RUPA um, that we hope would be incorporated into um, Senate Bill 71 in the form of a friendly amendment. Um, and then of course, I'm happy to take any questions from the committee. So um, again, just a high level overview um, of some of the benefits. 
um, included in RUPA. So we provide specific dormancy periods, um, which of course means how long the holder needs to keep on, um, holding on to property before transferring it to the custody of the state. Um, we address this for many new types of property. Um, in RUPA, we also provide clearer rules for cooperation between different states to locate owners um, and how to resolve competing claims by states um, uh, over the same property, more robust provisions for international cooperation as well. Um, again, RUPA is the latest iteration of our Unclaimed Property Act. As Senator Orenshaw pointed out, um, the earlier version of, of the Unclaimed Property Act is from 1995. And as we all know, um, there's been such an enormous um, change in technology and capability since then. So we also pay close attention in RUPA to um, providing clear rules regarding confidentiality and security of information regarding unclaimed property, recognizing that many of our records related to unclaimed property right now are electronic. Um, we enhance efficiency for notifying potential owners, processing their claims, again, by utilizing the internet and electronic records, um, which we really didn't have back in 1995. Um, we also include some remedies for holders, um, such as informal conferences between a holder and the unclaimed property administrator, um, including judicial and administrative review. Um, we also increase civil penalties for um, really egregious conduct of holders who have um, intentionally and unreasonably refused to transfer abandoned property over to the state. Um, again, that's just sort of a high level overview. I realize you don't have specific amendment language in front of you to review, um, but those are some of the main updates and main benefits that are contained in RUPA um, that we would hope that both the treasurer and the committee would consider um, in the form of a friendly amendment. And with that, I am, um, again, delighted to be here with you. Thank you, Senator Orenshaw, for inviting me to participate. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that the committee has. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and I will entertain questions at this time from members of the committee. I don't see hands raised. Don't see anybody jumping up. Oh, wait. Is that a Majority Leader Canizaro has a question? Yeah, I, I just have, I, I think it sounds like there are, and we have in front of us, Chair, um, a conceptual amendment to Senate Bill 71, which talks about some very specific pieces from RUPA that would be put into this bill. Um, I, I guess my struggle is, or I guess what I would ask of um, the folks working on this bill is to talk through some of these particular items uh, because generally I think talking about uniform laws or, or RUPA, we, I think on this committee all are very familiar with uniform laws and, and the fact that we have them, um, but we have not been adopting in wholesale just some of these uniform laws. It looks like there are some specific pieces here that may need to be discussed with the treasurer's office um, and and so I guess this is not really a question so much as it is a, a request um, and a concern to go through these specific items um, because this, this, this to me doesn't appear as though what we're trying to do is adopt all of RUPA. I think that would um, substantially change the way in which our treasurer's office and how they handle unclaimed property works and is a much different conversation than what um, is contained in this conceptual amendment. So I just, I'm looking forward to hearing more about those specific conversations and how um, it would be, how we could still allow for the treasurer's office to continue to do the good work that they're doing um, and not just a, a discussion about wholesale adoption of RUPA, which looks like it's been done in five states. Thank you, Majority Leader. And I saw Treasurer Conine shaking his head this direction. Do you wanna just comment briefly? Uh, sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I appreciate that comment, Vice Chair. Uh, and I appreciate Senator Orenshaw and, and Ms. Wolf for bringing this kind of thing forward. I think this type of conversation is important. In a real broad sense, uh, our intention with this uh, BDR and now this bill was to adopt pieces of ROPA that could be adopted without um, costs to the agency, right? Without having to change the ways that we currently work, without having to reformat, rebuild, or completely replace systems 
um, and without removing language that currently exists to protect Nevadans and Nevada businesses, things that have come apart specifically for Nevada. Um, to Chair, uh, excuse me, to Vice Chair Ken Azaro's point, five, I think, or six other states have fully adopted uh, ROPA. We've adopted a number of parts to it and continue to try and move away from the entropy that is individual state laws and into the uniform code. Uh, but I think it's really important that as we do that, we're looking specifically at language to determine where uh, we think it'll be detrimental to Nevadans or prohibitively expensive, right? I mean, a, a minor change in law to get closer to ROPA uh, might not be worth the squeeze if it requires a full sale, multi-million dollar change to our system, right? So uh, what we've committed to do offline is to have a conversation with Senator Orenshaw uh, and anybody else uh, who wants to be part of it to go through each of these items specifically uh, and discuss why we didn't include them in the first bill uh, when they were requested. And obviously we know what, what is in RUPA uh, and look for ways that we can get closer to it. But I, I think our, our goal is always to move closer to uniformity, but not at the expense uh, of Nevadans or not at significant expense to our office. So I appreciate that and look forward to those conversations. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate your willingness to work together. And it sounds like you guys are on the road to uh, a friendly amendment. And it looks like Senator Orenshaw wants to weigh in again. You're still. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And again, I want to thank the treasurer and his staff. They've been so great to work with. And uh, I know that, uh, I, you know, uh, sometimes uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a process working on these. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, what uh, is promulgated by the Uniform Law Commissioners, you know, um, does help in terms of, especially where issues are across state lines where someone, uh, you know, might have property in more than one state. And I understand it, it may, there may be a cost to some of this. I look forward to working with the treasurer and thank you for working with me and some of the other commissioners from Nevada and Ms. Wolf. All right, and with that, I don't see any other questions or comments. Um, do we have anybody else? I understand there's someone on back on the line at BPS. I'm not sure if they're in neutral. So uh, first, let's finish up with any neutral testimony. Is there anybody else who wants to testify in neutral? Thank you, Chair, to testify in neutral on Bill SB 71. Please press star nine now to enter the queue. Again, to testify in neutral on Bill SB 71, please press star nine now. Chair, it looks like we have no more callers at this time. All right, so I, there are no more callers at all. We have no more callers in neutral. Okay, did we have somebody in either support or opposition who joined us after I had moved on from that testimony? Chair, I'm, this is Bryce with Broadcast. Sorry about that. We had a little hiccup there. I'm, I'm just going to, if, it, if it's all right with you, I'll just roll the, um, the all through the opposition and the support, if that's okay. Sure. Perfect. Thank you so much. To testify in support of SB 71, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, callers to testify in support of SB 71, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Seeing none in support to take an, to, uh, excuse me, to testify in opposition of SB 71, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, caller, if you were calling to give testimony in opposition to the bill SB 71, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And chair, it looks like this caller may just in fact be listening. Uh, they did not indicate one way or the other. So I think it is safe for you to proceed. Thank you so much, um, esteemed staff. 
whose name does not pop up on my screen nor your face and I don't know your voices yet, but we appreciate you. And um, with that, I will close the hearing on SB 71 and we will move on to our last item on today's agenda, public comment. Perhaps our friend on the phone is here for public comment, which is limited to two minutes per person. And you may also submit public comments online via email, again, via fax, um, in written form, and we will read those as well. So if we could get the people in line for public co comment to go ahead and make their public comments. Sure thing, thank you, Chair. Sorry about the interruption. Uh, <clears throat> just checking your caller with the last three digits of 107. If you are giving public comment at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, caller with the last three digits, 107. On the call, if you are here to give public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. All right, caller with the last three digits of 107, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes. You may begin now. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We are hearing you here. Yes, ma'am. Good. For the record, my name is Mona Lisa Samuelson, and I represent medical cannabis patients living here in Nevada. And I'm calling in to thank Senator Sotomayor, I think it was, for looking out for Nevada's medical cannabis patients. His questions regarding Senate Bill 21, I think, are important ones. And I wanted to re reiterate how important it is that Nevada doesn't penalize its most vulnerable population. Medical cannabis patients deserve an equal opportunity for meaningful community engagement because we're not criminals. We are intelligent, thoughtful, and kind, and we appreciate legislators who look out for the good of our community. Thank you for allowing us this time. Thank you, caller. And with that, Chair, there are no more callers in the queue at this time. And did we get the spelling of the caller's name? I do not believe that the caller stated their name, though it was requested. Okay. Well, um, we'll try to do better next time. And if there's nobody else in line for public comment, and there's nothing else from any members of the committee. I will give you five seconds to speak now or hold your peace until 1 p.m. tomorrow. All right, it looks like our very first meeting of the Senate Judiciary is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.